campus. And he's the Margaret Vaughn Johnson Professor of Behavioral and Brain Science. Uh, he's also the Associate Director of the Texas Biomedical Device Center. Um, so very involved in uh, both brain plasticity, neurostimulation, and uh, neuroengineering. Um, Mike did his uh, undergrad out west at UC Berkeley, and then stayed on in the Baton Bay area to do work with Mike Morsnick at UCSF for his PhD. And then he came to UT Dallas and has been um, a very integrated force, I would say, across disciplines. So he is really a neurophysiologist and neuroscientist, but he's managed to work with many applied health organizations. And it looks like in his title, that'll be some of those today. He's worked on tinnitus, he's worked on stroke recovery, um, he's even worked on things like Rett syndrome. A uh, very diverse portfolio of funding. Um, but really committed to basic science. And I think that's one of the most impressive things about Mike is he's remained uh, very rigorous, very methodology driven, very sophisticated, while being able to bridge over to many of these important health populations and applications. So we're really excited to have him here. Uh, very timely talk because everyone's thinking about brain stimulation and neuromodulation and plasticity. And Mike is really one of the thought leaders in this area. We're very lucky to have him locally because he does talk nationally um, at many meetings. He's been a central figure in the uh, DARPA TNT and electrics programs. So he's got a lot of funding for that and done a lot of the important work on that. So uh, he's moved very much into um, clinical trials as well. So he's doing both animal and human work. Uh, very few people do that as well as he's doing it. So it's really impressive. Um, I'll conclude by saying just on a personal note, um, it's meaningful to me that Mike has um, Eagle Scout on his CV, um, <laughs> and my own sons are in, in Scouts, inspired to be Eagle Scouts, and I had this interesting experience a few years ago, I was with my kids in, in the park over by Prairie Creek, and I saw some people picking litter up, and it, it turned out to be none of the Mike Kilgar, who just took it upon himself to like help just clean up nature uh, with his kids. So that stands on my mind, it's just he's a very caring individual, and it shows the science, and uh, he's also renowned for his teaching. Uh, if you ever take a course with him, do so if you have that opportunity. Um, great guy, should be great talk, looking forward to it, Mike Kilgar. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I want to go through the animal background, the basis of the work I'm going to talk about relatively quickly. So you can see a lot of slides go through quickly, but I want to make sure that the basic science that comes through, uh, taking guesses about how to treat the brain has been a really challenge, but understanding and building from first principles is what uh, my lab is really most interested in doing. I don't even tell this audience the nature of the problem, right? There's a billion people with a serious neurological or psychiatric disorder worldwide. Uh, most of these things are not really preventable, uh, and certainly most are not curable. The list goes on and on and on. We can talk about each of these individuals. I'm going to talk about three just real briefly. Three have been working most critically on uh, for one very clear reason, and that's that uh, our global war on terror has caused a lot of blast injury and other kinds of uh, ways of getting your brain damaged. And when you damage the brain, you don't get one problem, right? You get a whole constellation of problems. After an improvised explosive device goes off, you've got six neurological disorders. And it makes it really hard to treat one when you've got five others sort of uh, nibbling at you in the back of your mind. For us, what we see as common about all these is that the treatments to these neurological and psychiatric disorders are going to be circuit based. We're going to have to rewire individual connections in a very specific manner if we want to go treat these devastating conditions that afflict uh, not just our warfighters, but many young people, old people, and their families. And this is just my reminder slide about the complexity of the spaghetti we're talking about. By 100 billion neurons means 1,000 trillion synapses. But we need to be able to write prescriptions to strengthen the connections that are too weak and weaken the connections that are too strong. And that's something that we can't do today. In principle, though, it isn't that hard to understand how you might envision a, a day where we would actually say, look, I know that this area is supposed to be connected here, but because of some insult, last car accident, uh, assault or other, there's no longer a connection there. Just one flavor of the kinds of problems you might have in your brain, just connection. Another, just as common, uh, is hyperconnection. You might end up finding out that it's not that you don't have enough connections, it's that you have too many of them in all the wrong places. And sometimes you've got a misconnection where you 
You don't need to just weaken it as you go. Weaken the right line and strengthen up. And these are the three flavors of problems you might have. And what we've come to understand in the context of most neurological and psychiatric conditions is all three are happening. Different parts of your brain are disconnected, different parts are hyperconnected, different ones are disconnected. And the vast majority are right. The vast majority of the brain is just fine. So don't go monkey around on all the other connections because 99% is fine. It only takes 1% of dysfunction to cause all the problems that we have for. So how are we going to be able to treat these things? Neuroscience has told us the answer. We can intervene in synapses using the way they normally learn things. It can cause long-term depression. You want to weaken the synapse. You call it long-term potentiation, you want to strengthen it. And some individual cells may need to go through both on the very same cell. That's not an impossible goal, but it's certainly a challenging one. Why do we have confidence we can do this? Because you're doing it now. No matter what you work on, if you practice and you're motivated, you're going to get some improvement. And what neuroscientists contribute mostly is descriptive. And that's the way we get better is with synaptic plasticity. That's not really much of a debate. What are other forms of plasticity? But that's one of the really important ones. Neurogenesis is not nearly as important as making new synapses. So how does this really work? The practice of over and over and over playing the scales is really driving activity in your brain. So the practice is the neural activity, and the motivation, though we love to take ownership of our own agency in the world, from the neurons' point of view, is really releasing these neurotransmitters, serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, and others. So building on work from Alfredo Kirkwood at Johns Hopkins University, we now know basically how synapses feel. Whether they strengthen or weaken depends upon the relative timing of pre and post synaptic activity. If the cell fires and causes the cell downstream to fire, it tends to strengthen. If you're firing in the reverse order, it tends to weaken. But only those two things happen if your transmitters, neuromodulators in particular, are released within about two seconds. So if the event happens, you get to learn it. You get to hit the tennis ball, and you get to look and see did I get an ace? If I got an ace, that's the thing I want to learn on. And the brain is Spanning these very different time scales, milliseconds determines whether you strengthen the weak, and seconds determines whether or not you cared about it enough to really want to do that change. So I won't go through all the long history. Uh, back with Mike Mercy, we started with deep brain stimulation, trying to understand the principles. You put an electrode deep in the brain, stimulate the release of acetylcholine, for example, from nucleus basalis, and depending upon the experience you have, I can make neurons shift their maps increase or decrease the number of neurons that produce a given uh, response. I can increase the selectivity or the sensitivity of neurons. I can increase or decrease temporal processing rates. I can make neurons selective to particular sequences. I can uh, generate changes in the synchronization patterns. And these changes are very long lasting and directly influence learning and memory. There's a big problem, of course, with taking a big poker and shoving it down in your brain. Uh, most people don't want one. That's one problem. Uh, the other one is just as important you're missing other targets. Whatever target you stimulate, what about the targets you aren't stimulating? So nucleus basalis is very important. The pseudocolon is critical for learning. If I block it, you'll learn nothing, period. But the same thing is also true of normal memory. If I block normal memory, I don't remember any either. Normally, these very different brain areas work in concert. They work together. So when you're aroused and interested, it's not one neurotransmitter from the base. It's dozens. So the idea we wanted to come up with was a way where we can take the brief burst a pseudocolonial neuromodulator, which marks an experience is important, repeatedly combine it with a particular experience, the sound, the movement, the thought, and drive some natural plasticity. How do you do that? I tried drugs for five years. You could get lots of pseudocolonial neuromodulator to be released by taking your amphetamine or cocaine or whatever else, but they're on for an hour. And it doesn't allow you to pick individual events. In the real world, it's about individual events which happen on a second time scale. To make a very long story short, if I stimulate a nerve in your neck of the vagus nerve, the 10th cranial nerve, when I stimulate it, it sends a signal to the brain that says, oh my god, something just happened. Right? Maybe your brain thinks you have a heart attack. What's well, nice is you don't notice it at all. It's not your vagus nerve, you would never notice. But your neurons do. And they respond with a brief burst of a pseudocolon and more than that, very convenient for the brains. We do it with safe as 80,000 patients have already been implanted in treatment of epilepsy. We thought we would need way less, like 100 times less. We actually use 500 times less than the FDA has already approved. We just need a little bit to learn just the right time to drive the process. We knew that vagus nerve stimulation would trigger all of the happy molecules. I'm a biochemist. I'll tell them I'm a recovering molecular biologist. It hasn't turned out to be very helpful for people with a lot of psychiatric disorders. 
go in there and gene my college and science graduates and then you know what's wrong with them. There's nothing good at it. It's not very satisfying. But certainly we know it has all genes that can be modulated, release of neurotransmitters, activation of receptors, change in the post side, increasing or decreasing synaptic connectivity. But we want to understand how can we use this to our advantage to treat patients. So we have this tool for activating locus aurelius and nucleus basalis. The hypothesis initially was if we pair it with an experience like a tone, a low tone, or a high tone, I did that over and over and over again. Would that reorganize your brain? So this old ancient paper now in 2011, we confirmed this basic idea. I can send information into your brain, into your ear, by blank sound, and into your arousal system, your nervous system, by activating the vagus nerve. We do this over and over, over the time, over a few bursts of stimulation of the vagus nerve, wait 30 seconds, do it again, do this a couple hundred times a day, a couple hours a day, you take a break, do that the next day, so there's a lot of stimulations, but for each of these little moments of time, it still ends up being less than 1% of the stimulation that has already been proven to be effective uh, and safe for individuals with epilepsy and depression. The question was, could we reorganize the brain with it safely in humans? We started with work in animals and showed that we could reorganize primary motor cortex, secondary motor cortex, the lower brain stem areas, even the motor system on show you. We change temporal responses, enhanced responses to speech sounds. Each of these papers, building this arsenal of tools, we were going to need if a clinician was going to come in and say, we have a lot of problems, I need to go target each of these problems one at a time and direct change. So here's how we do this experiment specifically. An animal normally had an equal number of neurons responding to each of the different octaves across its hearing range. Um, you see that about a uh, fifth of neurons respond to uh, this region around 19 kilohertz. I get double the number of neurons. This is thousands and thousands, probably. 50 to 80,000 neurons are shifting from responding to one thing to another because I told it this is really, really important. The subjects in this case hear another tone, four kilohertz tone, just as often, but it's not marked by the so much. It's like you pick out among two different experiences which one do I want the brain to learn, which one do I want it to recall. That's in a sensory system. We've also done this in the motor system. I can activate different neurons in the motor system by having animals do different tasks. Right? Move your hand, the hand neurons fire, and your shoulder, your shoulder neurons fire. If I pair a nerve stimulation, I can reorganize primary and motor cortex. So open up the cortex, skull of a rat, stick electrodes down in the top. What you see is most neurons move the hand, just like in us. A bunch move the head or jaw, the red ones. Uh, and a very small number move the shoulder, just you don't need very many neurons to do that. If we pair a nerve stimulation just a thousand times, with a movement that causes that green part of the brain to fire, you see an enormous increase in the number of neurons that respond, as I produce that number. So I can make more neurons respond to things, and I can make more neurons that produce outputs, so I can control both inputs and outputs. I can even increase the number of neurons respond to the hand, which was already a very little representation to go here. We know how this works. We record it in locus aurelius. It's a, do your eyes really fire when you activate this? Do you really just wonder about it? You don't try to damage it, that's a really hard target to find. You stick an electrode into the port. You're a physiologist, and you see your eyes going, you don't have to wonder. When I activate the vagus nerve, your locus aurelius will fire. Because you just received this powerful signal from an autonomic nervous system. You just say, oh my god. What's cool is it doesn't hurt. It's the same thing, like pinching really hard. Right? But no one's going to come in for rehab because they've pinched several thousand times. Right? That's not going to work. <laughs> This is neither rewarding or reversible. It's just engaging and arousing to the neural networks that help you learn how to reorganize your neurons. We know that the neurotransmitters in the release include norepinephrine, serotonin, and acetylcholine because we separately and systematically, as Daniel Holmes and our fellow students, review the experiment I should before with the double or triple number of neurons that produce that shoulder movement, the proximal joints in the shoulder. But if the animals receive the same amount of training and the same amount of vagus nerve stimulation, but they've had a lesion in any of these three areas, there's no plasticity whatsoever. So these are really not working in a cocktail. It's not which one's more important. It's not an and operation. It's an and and operation. We need at least all three of these, which really suggests we're engaging a very diverse network, exactly the opposite of what we started off doing in the molecule biology. We wanted to target the particular molecule that's doing the thing. It turns out that biology doesn't usually have molecules that do things. They do many, many things, and they work in very complex networks. 
this is engaging a broad and evolutionarily ancient mechanism of engaging the arousal mechanism. So how do we think about the change we can make? When I play at home, I have this small number of neurons. In this case, it's a mat, and you feel it's neurons fire, and you're on the your body neurons, hear the sound of them fire. The same thing happens in the room, I move my shoulder. There's very body neurons, they may get some input, but they don't fire. If over and over I take some subset of neurons in your brain, and I constantly have acetylcholine and over and after and serotonin being released at exactly that moment, <coughs> nearby neurons will begin to take on the properties of their friends. So people eventually have this bad experience, it's much better, whether it's in the motor system or the auditory system or the amygdala or the hippocampus, it doesn't matter. This is the way we learn. The first question we had was, can we use this to do good? I've been building on this for whatever that was uh, a dozen years, trying to get it now this tool, is it any good? It wasn't really clear that driving plasticity would be helpful for anybody. That was a hypothesis. But our first hypothesis was, let's start with the simplest form of that we really understand. Keep that complicated, complicated, feeling it's complicated. How about stroke? Stroke's easy. You know why someone has got disability. Everything was fine. One day a clot was thrown. You had ischemia and a given region of the brain, and those neurons died. A little more complicated than that, but it's at least well understood compared to other neurological and such. And there's areas nearby that are still intact. Most neurons are not destroyed by stroke. So why can't the other neurons take over this uh, job that got lost by a bunch of neurons who were killed? Well, they can. If you do physical rehabilitation, you do get better. Most people get better. And so some neurons are in case that the number area begins to recover. People can move again and walk again. But they never really get back to it. They never really get back to work. They never get back to the piano. They never get back to older than they did commonly. Before you have them back in. So we wanted to know if we were to repeatedly impair Betty's curve stimulation, that subset of neurons, could we engage the others who weren't convinced to make a shift, to give up their old job and take on a new job? Could we make them begin to have a new life in a way that isn't possible with rehabilitation, but by adding much more salient signal? Could we make changes that are not otherwise possible? We made an animal model of um, stroke. We inject the vasoconstrictor that causes ischemia, the confusion, and dream that's in the whole brain. We developed a broad literature in a bunch of engineers, lots and lots of behavioral tools. We can train several hundred animals a day, produce these very precise strokes, and then measure very precisely the portions, the and the flexibility that they have. In this case, it's a force task, which have the full again. We randomize the groups, which we duplicates a lesion and rehabilitation in sense, daily rehabilitation, the gold standard, hundreds of trials per day, every single day, every single day, the perfect compliance, right, so we're at. Versus another group who gets the exact same thing, we're just going to add a little brief first day to the mention and find out who they do better than they do with rehabilitation life. We're measuring with computers in real time precisely how hard they're pulling, so we can measure. That trial was 2% better than another trial. I want to pick this trial, not that trial. You know what? The therapist can't actually do it. You're watching someone. It's hard to tell. And you're an ace, you can tell it's an ace. But most things are not aces. We can measure precisely what the movement is in student life, the Vegas unit, at exactly that moment. Let's give you a sense of how this works. We have a lot of attack and measuring in real time. And pretty happy with the food we have in struggling and squatting, doing the best that you can. But the animals have DNS has made a dramatic improvement. We can document this time and time. And you can see plots that look like this. So this is just the bit rate. So here they're going to pull 120 grams. It's pretty easy to pull that, right? They weigh 300 grams. They can easily pull a third of the weight, no problem. They can pull all the weight back. They didn't have to pull a third of the weight after stroke. It's a different part. You can pull it just that way. When we do intensive daily rehabilitation, they get better. They make a statistically significant improvement, but they're still impaired. We have good, but it doesn't get what we want. We add Vegas nerve stimulation, this gives the animal's medic a good recovery, as good as, as, good as a little bit. Now, to make sure the new task is too simple, so we train on more complicated tasks. We build tasks that require animal internal doorknobs to move in a rapid sequence. So, letters, um, we have the same thing. All these published studies, again, hundreds of animals total. 
In this particular task, you really complicated task. You could be doing that all day long. You never end with the word program suit. All the other questions told us that. They said, yeah, it makes wrong, but that's fine. But try to get it into the program. I'm having that in that average code. That's true. In a rat, too. If you have them running and you do intensive rehabilitation, they don't make any gains at all. You just can't ever get them again. That sequence is too complicated. As they get nursing loans, they're still impaired, but they're making progress they wouldn't otherwise make. You see the same thing with speed, these animals have to press a lever down, back up and back down, and half a second, three <coughs> fast. So you do it, they get bad at it, they get slow when you add stroke, add rehabilitation, they get better, add rehabilitation with DNS, and they get more better. <laughs> Okay, that's fine. These are all young animals. Million, so it really didn't happen. Repeat the whole study in old animals. Repeat the whole study when you wait a long time before you deliver the intervention. We did both of those things that made no difference. It's not that old brains aren't plastic. It's not plastic. It's not that you have to get there within a week. We can wait months. We had reasons to believe based on the experiments that I told you about that the timing was really precise. And so we said, let's take another group and give them the same VNS. And VNS is so good for you. Maybe VNS alone makes you help. So here we did that same experiment, shows you before, but many, many weeks after the um, uh, stroke, six weeks here, VNS doesn't occur until six weeks. The other group that receives VNS gets exactly the same VNS, they just get it two hours after we have it. It's not occurring during the movements at all. No benefit whatsoever. In all of the experiments I've shown you and will show you, we eventually look at not just responses while we're living in BMS, we want to make permanent improvements. So all the changes we showed that the BMS is not causing any improvement. <coughs> it's causing the plasticity that supports it. So you turn off the BMS and make the bed it's still there. And it lasts for weeks and weeks and weeks, as I'll show you. So that's fine, but if you only get better for one thing you train on, this is another problem. Right? I can get better at the thing I train on, but I can generalize to the real world. We did that experiment as well. I showed you that pronation, supination data. The rat gets bad, it stays bad. Give them therapy and they make a much better recovery. I then took these animals who were turning this knob, and one day they come out. They show up and I drop them in, and there's a handle there. There's no BNS at all. There's a handle there. The animal goes, I don't know what to do. But we threw a pellet and they pull the handle. The rat's not stupid. And I'm turning the animal and pulling. Okay, fine. They figured that in one day. We grab the hungry rat, but no, so we've got to reach the handle, a lever, a uh, slot, we grab the thing, maybe something different, and they figure out the first day. The very first day, they're already significantly better. We then train on this other task, both groups, for weeks. Okay? And the benefit persists, though there's no DNS at all. So we then switch them back to the supervision task, and the benefit is still there. Okay? Suggesting so you can generalize. We call this near generalizing. In both cases, the animals are reaching the same slot. They're not bad, different tasks. But the difference between this and this, it gains different muscles, different sequences. So it's probably not going to help their back leg walk better. But it is optimistically encouraging that you're not just improving the very thing that you're training for. We wanted to test whether other kinds of injuries, right? Skin is important, but there's many other ways the brain gets injured. So we did other studies with lots and lots of animals, repeated, with hemorrhagic stroke, with traumatic brain injury, with a piston, just put straight in the brain and smack the brain directly. We did it with spinal cord injury. In each of these cases, very different models, very different brain areas engaged and damaged, and potentially very different ways to recover. In each case, the nervous system needs to be engaged with this feedback that says, which trials are above average? And in each case, the feedback that's normally helping you learn is not there. When I hit a tennis serve, I know what my muscles are doing, because I don't have range. The point is, whether you have peripheral nerve injury, or spinal cord injury, hemorrhagic stroke, the basal ganglia, or a cortical stroke, all of those are going to swell up the network. But if they move, any place you screw it up, you're going to be in trouble. In any place you add back that feedback, you're going to be able to make progress apparently, which you wouldn't otherwise make with rehab alone. If the rehab doesn't give you sufficient feedback at the neural level with sufficient timing. Okay, how do we really know that timing matters? Can you do that experiment? Sure, we can do that experiment as well. We're measuring an animal's pull strength, for example, as much as spinal cord through animals, and some are better than others. Each time is supposed to pull, but I'm measuring in real time which ones are stronger. What happens if I deliver VNS only on the top fifth of trial? Just pick the very winners. The animals make a recovery. What happens if I deliver the same amount of VNS during rehabilitation, but it's during trial where they aren't particularly good? They're still reaching, they're still engaging those muscles, they're still doing it. But I'm just picking to reward four trials. It doesn't hurt them, but it doesn't help. You have to pick the winners. 
the better ones, help us encourage the sophisticated network, make progress toward a particular goal, the neurons need information that they don't have by just reaching and grabbing and trying to get help. We can do it on 50% of trials, we can do it on 100% of trials, it doesn't matter. The top 20 are doing all the action. Those aces are what's helping you. Playing the perfect note, that's what's really making it. Not all the practice is important. So how does this work? It's cool. But all this is behavior. I want to know as a neuroscientist, what's happening? I told you there's neuroplasticity someplace. Can I see the neuroplasticity? I'd like to see it. I'd like to see new connections being made. It'd be convenient if you can manage to spend a lot of money building tools for that. And they did. But I didn't have to build. So they had tools that I can actually do one injection into a muscle. And that injection of a virus will infect that muscle. And that infectious agent will transfer from neuron to neuron to neuron and label the entire motor pathway. Every 12 hours, get another synapse. And I can literally see which cells in the brain are connected to this particular muscle that's involved in closing the hand. Like a Christmas tree, right? Here's 10,000 to one. It's obvious these motor neurons are labeled. You look up in the courses, you see the actual cells that are connected to that particular muscle. Took a bunch of animals who had a stroke. We get half of them DNS and half of them not, as I've shown them many times. In this case, in the experiment, we inject them, and then we go and see how many neurons are there that are connected to the hand. And the animals who made that recovery made that recovery not by magic, not because they wanted to, but because there are new connections that were not formed by rehabilitation alone. They were only formed when we added this feedback that they're not getting because they can't really feel that good. They don't have the release of neurotransmitters because they've got brain injury in that very area. So many things are going against brain injury in the individual. We were amazed to see this three to five fold increase in the number of connections. So we wonder, what's happening on the other side? Is it all paradigm? The brain's just part of that. It uses all available resources. I can have the other side. Why do those? Now we all know that everything is done contra, lateral, right? That's just how it uses it. After injury, there's the opportunity to use neurons from a totally intact hemisphere. Which is great, that means there's plenty of neurons to go around. If you can increase the number of neurons on both sides, there's often spare tissue to recover with. So before stroke, you have very few neurons on the uh, isolateral side connected to these muscles. After rehab, again, very few. You're increasing with the DNA plus BNS both populations on the contralateral side and the isolateral side. It's really encouraging to us that we don't have to know exactly where to make these changes. The neural network will figure it out. It's really pretty clever. We're really proud of our brains, except in the context of injury, or it never does very well. But if we can provide the piece of information that's missing, maybe it can do way better than it's done before. So we took spinal cord injury as a model. Okay? And we looked at two different types of spinal cord injury, right? One is called Brown's car syndrome, where someone's damaged just half of your spinal cord, and that obviously causes. Uh, Paralysis or hemiplesis uh, on the lateral side. We also call it central core syndrome, where we made a contusion right in the middle. And we cut the spinal cord, no one's going to get it done. But the vast majority of patients don't have cut, transected spinal cord. They've got <coughs> induced, damaged spinal cords. So in each case, we've left a little bit of tissue remaining, not much, but a little bit left. And in each case, it didn't matter that the tracks in the spinal cord that were damaged were totally different. In fact, mostly non overlapping these two models. In both cases, that DNS made a recovery that would not otherwise happen. What we can do then is check the cortical plasticity, open up the cortex, which is not in fact at all, right? Cortical spinal cord, and spinal cord, C5, the most common area of humans in spinal cord. I open up cortex, cortex is fine, I stick electrodes in, I stimulate, guess what? The neurons don't fire. They don't make a palm. Why not? Because he has spinal cord. But if you added the external stimulation, you get four times more neurons that can produce that movement. But we only get in one model and not the other model. There's all these technologies that they or what's going on, how can that be? But it actually makes sense. One model destroys the cortical spinal tract. If the cortical spinal tract has been destroyed, which is what happens, and that's just maybe more than that, and you want to go through after lunch, but here's the cortical spinal tract, right? And in this model, there is no cortical spinal tract. We just took a big black and went, bam, it's gone. So how can you use it? You can't use that. So there's no cortical plasticity right, in one model, but there is another model. So wait, what's going on? How can this be? The idea is maybe they're using other networks. So again, we take another set of uh, animals, again, with these two lesions, half of the VNS and half of the down, 
and we inject the grasping muscles, and we see in a hypothesis neutral area where are the neurons that are connected to these muscles. And what we see is the way we got that cortical plasticity in the model where the cortical spinal tract is open is by quadrupling the number of connections between the grasping muscles themselves and the cerebral cortex. In a group where didn't have any plasticity there, that's because there's no more neurons there. That's because they're in the trapped connection. We can't do anything possible. But the animals made a recovery. How can that be? The way they did it is there were other traps. You guys will notice here, the surrounding areas, there's still some fibers that don't get damaged, and those project the red nucleus, the nucleus spinal tract, can also control them. And the focus spinal tract, located in their location. So the idea is the brain is just like us, trying to find a problem. Economic systems, biological systems tend to be less flexible. They adapt, they find new ways. Life won't be stopped. If you give them feedback, if you can tell what's happening, you can't, then all these systems fail. So if you're appropriate feedback, we can use the cortical network when it's available, we can use the brain stimulus nuclear How far does this go? You can perform a nerve entry. I won't be surprised. If you cut the nerves, nerves will really well, right? If you talk to patients, they'll say they grow back, and so feel something that feels so good. So we did a five millimeter gap repair of both the median and ulnar nerves, and sure enough, the animals had long-lasting lifetime deficits, right? They can't pull as strong as they can. Add the mass again, they make a gain. Do it unpaired, look at two hours later, nothing to do with inflammation or anything else. It's the timing, the rewiring of the network using the spared fibers. Everything gets scrambled by cutting this and having it regrow. We need to sort out who's from. We can now look at sensitivity, right? How many grams does it take the animal to detect you poking on his paw? It's elevated an animal and cut the nerve. Of course it's elevated, and I don't feel so good. Add Vegas nursing much, not completely better, but it's dramatically improved. It you know, detects touches of your paw, it wouldn't be able to detect otherwise. And again, it doesn't change it, doesn't improve it if you've got uh, big ass to in an unpaired manner. We can now try to understand what's going on. We can look at the grasping muscles, right? This is, those muscles are controlled by the median and ulnar nerve. You can't close your hand because I cut the nerve. Good for that. That's not too surprising. When I add VNS, I can restore the function because they've regrown. Perfect nerves regrow. But there's also pathological plasticity. Sometimes plasticity is bad. And what you get in the rehab only nerve is too much wrist extension. The spare nerve is the radial nerve. The other nerve expands radially. First, it showed this in the 80s. Okay? And so, is that good for you or bad for you? We think it's bad for you. So we have been able to reduce the number of neurons that produce wrist extension. In a normal animal, you never get neurons that make this movement, which is not what we're seeing. But an injured animal, there's tons. Because at first, the regular nerve is going to be shown in town. And it took over all that territory. And then when the median and the blew back in, sorry buddy, I've already filled up all my spots. My dance car's full. You're out. But that's not a death sentence. It doesn't have to be that way. It happens to be that way. We can repeat the same experiment in lesion nucleus basalis and animals with no benefit whatsoever. Even with the precise time, over and over, rehabilitation plus vagus nerve stimulation. You don't have the ability to release nerve transmitters, you're not going to get any better. And again, the sensory thresholds normally recover, but now don't recover from the basalis sensation. We can take the same model and actually look. Now, these are two new viruses. There's a red one and a green one. We can Activate the muscles that extend, and activate the muscles uh, that flex. Okay? And what we see is, with VNS, we're not changing the number of neurons that do the wrist extension, that's the same number. But we're doing a dramatic, almost tenfold increase in the number of neurons that make the wrist flex. That's what you need to do to close your hand, grab the hand on the pole. But not just that. Many of these neurons are double labeled after injury, because the brain just goes, I don't want to do a whole lot of anything. You get lots of neurons that are simultaneously connecting up closing muscle groups. That sounds stupid. That's not totally stupid. Sometimes color contraction is a good thing. You can get rigidity by locking down the same muscles. But each time these muscles, this neuron wire, is connected to both two opposing muscles. You don't want too many of those. So what we see is we can move from 25% double labeled, co contracting, down to a more normal only 5 or 6%. We're just showing you here this overlapping Venn diagram of the model, dramatically increasing. Dramatically increasing the number of neurons that produce uh, risk flexion, but also dramatically reduce the number of the I told you it's not just strengthening things. I've got to weaken the things that are bad and strengthen the things that are good. And that requires a little bit more sophistication. So here's the idea in a nutshell what I've shown you so far reaching, 
grasping, pulling. These are different things. Different networks do. I need to keep them distinct. After an injury, whether it's spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, uh, stroke, hemorrhage, uh, you get a little muddy water. Tell me there's no movement. There's usually something. But they're all kind of overlapping. There's a lot of confusion. They're all now with a scramble. The rehabilitation may begin to be less overlapping, but still too overlapping to restore function. What we think is happening is the vagus nerve stimulation, the strengthening of good synapses, weakening of bad synapses, and helping to pull these individual representations apart. We've done all this work trying to figure out can we do this in lots of different models in a rat, but of course nobody wants to help rats. Everybody wants to help patients, so let's jump into patients. The idea is if every time the patient moves his arm, we would activate a device in the neck that would stimulate the nerve, we do the very same thing in patients. So I'll show you briefly what this looks like before and after the patient. We're going to start in the uh, United Kingdom where the regulatory burden is a little bit easier to get into patients. You can find the devices there, um, and uh, this patient well, uh, covered up and eventually went on social media. It's all, all about his experiences here. He just had a trouble lift, grabbing that lock, lifting it and placing it on the lock. That was a standard test, and he's bad at it. He's rubbing his hands, he doesn't work very well. You'll see eventually he grabs it and he doesn't really place it up there, he scrapes it out of his hand, okay, after it drops. But he's trying to stretch, there's all these reflexes, they're all screwed up. And when you stretch it, up, it all pops out. That's not a very useful hand. But he eventually gets it to work. What you're going to see after, it's actually going to be three months after the very day of the He did six weeks of rehab, just three times a week. But every time he reached and grabbed and felt and turned and flipped, and all the other things you do in rehab, we had a brief burst of the day of the to help find those neural networks that are remaining and are engaged. But then there's a very long part of the to say movement now. He's doing go signal and places the block on top. He's asked to do it again, reset, time to make sure it wasn't the flu. What you can look normally with stroke patients where the development is linear, compensatory strategy is in, you look at different camera angles. This is the kind of movement you like to have if your fingers do what they want to do, you place it up there, and you like it. So the way we assess these stroke scores is using the fecal minor score, specifically the upper extremity subscore. And each point is basically a new skill you've had to have before and you have to have. With intensive rehabilitation for six weeks, it's been well known in dozens of studies, but you get three or four points of improvement. They fade if you wait six months or so. But you do get, we got the same everyone else show, because all we had is the same as everyone else we got. When you add Vegas nerve stimulation, you have three times the benefit. The problem was, these patients know who's who. They know who's who I've had. I got advice, you don't. I'm going to work a lot harder, right? Hey, we did another study, double blind, placebo control. Everybody gives us an implant, but we only turn it on and have patients. Like Sox wasn't going to turn it on. But we had the exact same thing. So nobody knew who was being stimulated. We didn't share stimulation everywhere. They all felt it. They all thought they were active. The nice thing for those who didn't get turned on is we said, we have to redo all that we have. Same therapist, same exercise, the same six weeks, adding DNS. You think of the seventh through twelfth week. So this is the third replicate of this in humans, and this finishes a five-site randomized study. It's not yet published, but it should be soon. So we're now in a fifteen-site double-blind placebo-controlled study of 120 patients. This will be a pivotal trial to develop this uh, uh, technology for patients. Before my therapy, I had a hard time. I couldn't dress myself. I couldn't tie my own shoes. Right after my stroke, the thing that really impacted me the most was the fact that I had lost you know, my independence, I had lost the career and all the hobbies that I really enjoyed. And one of the things that really surprised me about the Vegas nerve stimulation trial is the ease of the surgery. Actually having a device implanted was really a non-event. The, the other big benefit is it allows you, you have unlimited usage. Once you have the implant in, and you go home after your trial period, uh, you get a number of exercises to use, and you take a magnet and you rub it over your chest, and that turns the DNS on. It just couldn't be any simpler to use. And when I went home, I started actually using Vegas nerve stimulation with my fishing reel to get back, to help get back the ability to reel. And so I pick a task that I want to be able to do, and I practice doing that every day using Vegas nerve stimulation. After my therapy, I can now reel a reel with my left hand. As a matter of fact, 
three weeks ago with one of my best friends. We went fishing to a, a lake close to my house for the first time since I had gotten sick. And I was able to cast out and reel in. My mood has improved dramatically since my therapy. I'm much happier now than I was before because I see a light at the end of the tunnel. At least every day I can actually tie my shoes. There gives you a sense, we're trying not just to get better at the task we're training to, but restore function. Some people were literally using a base or simulation and shooting with shotguns, or women were out gardening. There's all kinds of things being done out there. We can't get the timing quite as precise, but it's still a lot of action while they're engaged, we can deliver these neuromodulators. So just give you a sense of the inclusion that's the criteria we use. It's not appropriate for everybody, but it's a much broader range than, let's say, for constraint use therapy or other kinds of trials where many patients are like screening. Uh, basic design is shown here. Everyone's going to get the latest nerve stimulation. This is the latest start. So you have to randomize double line placebo control. How do you do that? If everybody gets a surgery, we're going to turn on a half. And when we delay it, we say, sorry, we're back. But if you want to, you do it again. They all say yes. Uh, and then we run them again and get a better statistical power because every single subject uh, is uh, actually an active control, an active screen. So what does the look like? They do seven different tasks. Uh, and then we do two tasks that they're interested in. Some patients want to buckle the belt, some want to brush their hair, different things they get to pick. Um, one of the patients um, made an improvement in the motor function, but he still had really severe sensory function, uh, which was weird because we were supposed to exclude those patients, but you know, the trials run. He snuck through. And he really had trouble feeling anything. He closed his eye, he had no idea what was happening. Uh, and so his 200 gram threshold is pretty high. Uh, we developed a strategy just for him to blindfold him and give him some paint brushes and touches and put items in his hand. And he went from 200 grams down to 30 grams. And he went from detecting one out of 10, which is chance items using a, a stereognosis task, you know, what do I put in your hand, uh, up to 70% correct, which was for him uh, very helpful. And the idea is before a stroke, you get lots of neurons. After a stroke, you get one or two left. After repeatedly pairing the search and much, we may be we still need to find those neurons and make them useful for complex tasks. Next condition I want to talk about is tinnitus. Syndrome like chronic pain where you lose inputs and neurons become hyperactive. The concept now is the opposite. Instead of strengthening, I want to weaken. So by sending in signals to the healthy areas, I might be able to, by competition, shrink the hyperactive area and restore more normal functionality. So we showed in this old nature paper, we could do that in rats, but again, who cares about curing tenors in rats? We showed that they looked like they were better, but you don't really know, you can't ask about what they did. Uh, we completed two studies now in chronic tenors patients. It's not that we're curing, it's not that it's all magically gone. 50% of patients are 50% better. It's called 75% failure, but 25% active recovery is something we're quite proud of for those people who are responding. We're still trying to figure out what's different about those who respond and those who don't. But the therapy is all the original. Mm -hmm. Maybe one of those slippers, maybe you're not, but everyone can, in the comfort of their own home, connect to the computer and lose the precisely timed uh, tones that I described, combined with the vagus nerve stimulation of drive reorganization. With Sarah Vanessa, we can actually image these individuals using EMG technology, um, and we can actually see the changes in hypersynchrony, right? In this case, the reduction in the known elevated hypersynchrony in uh, tennis patients is reduced. In the 17 patients that said that he was involved both in the Belgian study and in King and Dallas and the West study. So he combined those two studies to get this uh, new report. Now the question is how are we going to do this for all these people? Medical devices are super expensive. What if tens of thousands of people need devices that cost tens of thousands of dollars? It's going to bankrupt our healthcare system. So with Rob Renneker, we've been working on a much smaller device. So this is the new device. It's really, really tiny. Um, it can be implanted in a 30 minute outpatient procedure. It's really not a very big deal. Uh, it doesn't have a battery, so there's no recharging, there's nothing it needs to break, so it's a many orders of magnitude improvement over old technologies. It's all new modern manufacturing techniques. The actual chip is embedded in glass, which is, of course, uh, chemically inert. Uh, and then that is housed inside the little tiny uh, silicon cup that holds it on the baby's nose. This next generation device, as I mentioned, is smaller, cheaper, less invasive, it's completely more like compatible. You don't see anything at all in testing. It's a lot of programmable. Now we just finished all of the FDA required testing uh, in large animals, and so we're ready for patients. So the concept then is this device is under your skin on this nerve. We can power it with a chip that sits outside, it is battery powered. But that sends the signal in wirelessly, power and the signal. 
And that power and control module is held on by a little uh, neck strap or um, a neck band. And again, the Bluetooth means your cell phone can talk to you. And so you can have a tone being played by the cell phone, not a laptop. Walk around and put your money with Run your earbuds up and have the stimulation of the base nerve drive your monitors, and the cell phone can drive the tones. If you needed to produce a movement, we can put a device in your hand, measure how it does, just like the rat, use that feedback, and so we've built a whole host of the gun testing and spinal cord patients uh, here in Dallas, uh, in collaboration with Pinball Hall at uh, React. Uh, we can actually find patients, measure their abilities, no surprise they have trouble with producing uh, forces, whether they're twisting or pinching or uh, wrist extension and flexion. And so the idea is we can then put the computer up, and so the rat's just pulling the pellets. We've got a video game you're playing, right? We turn them out, and we can adjust it all you want a little bit. We can use that. So instead of just getting bored, we can keep regaining a little bit of uh, Atari or whatever you're doing, but again, it's being tracked in real time so that we know that the legs are being activated. What about for walking? We can, um, with new technology, be able to activate, so here's a device on a cell phone, measuring my leg, you see every time I lift my leg, the little thing turns green. It's not magic technology, I'm wearing something in my pocket, and it measures the angle of my leg, and so here's uh, Rob Renner doing the same thing, but when there's three sensors, you strap them on and all the rest. But the idea that this could be simultaneously communicating with my leg device, and also connecting to my cell phone and activating a nerve in my neck and helping rehab means that the knowledge we gain, we know what that looks like, right? Stroke patients don't look the leg much, they do this sort of thing. But sometimes they look a little more than average. If I can just pick out that that was a little better than average and drive the network toward recovery, we're likely to expect gains that would not otherwise be possible. So the NS would be added on the top 20%, I'd say, in the hope that we can go improve them and push that the elevation back higher so you don't have foot drop and then drop and falls. So just wrap up the concept then is Vegas nerve stimulation can be used to react from one of the neurons, whether they're involved in the motor system, sensory system, or the principal cognitive. I haven't talked about our work in collaboration with Kristen McIntyre in post-traumatic stress disorder, but suffice it to say we're able to create the first animal model of post-traumatic stress disorder, but they're not overly proud of actually, uh, and then show that we could treat it, that it could not be treated without it. With exposure therapy alone, but adding exposure therapy plus the nerve stimulation, you can get gain you don't otherwise get. For our soldiers, of course, which is what I started with, they had all these problems, not one of them. But if one device can be used to make the rehab that they're doing more effective, then you end up with a real game changer. So we've already completed office based treatments, we're ready for all of them. For tenderness, stroke, and PTSD, we hope to be beginning to clear PTSD patients in Dallas. Uh, later this year. But we would eventually like to move into completely at home. So we're again building these wireless devices so that you could do some of these imaginal therapies or virtual reality based uh, therapies at home. So just wrap up kind of how we think about this. I told you that you can activate the blood of You don't want too much, you want just the right amount. And normally, when you're engaged in rehab, it's boring. It's just boring. Watch patients do rehab, it's boring. Watch kids do ADA, it's boring. It's not much fun. All we need to do is engage these networks. But they're a little worse than that. Sometimes it's just stressful. And what I didn't tell you about is that the vagus nerve is the parasympathetic branch of the, of the autonomic nervous system. So when you activate it, it activates the rest and digest. So it's the only tool that is simultaneously engaging the central nervous system and sedating or relaxing to the peripheral nervous system. Lots of drugs are never enhancing. All of them enhance anxiety. Lots of drugs reduce anxiety. All of them block learning, memory, and plasticity. This is the only tool ever found that has the dual action of relaxing your body, lowering your blood pressure, slowing your breathing, at the same time as activating and arousing the central nervous system. So getting these um, uh, arrows right in the right region where we want to engage but calm. Uh, and many people for you know, a thousand years of study is going to be know that to the motion. We know that the timing is really important. So this, when you do a rehab, you do this. It may be, well, it's really maybe activated, but it adapts pretty quickly. Folks well, realize this is a fault of novelty. The novelty runs out. It's hard to keep making up new pictures and whatever. We have your hands all want. We need thousands and thousands of trials. Plus, a lot of these patients have elevated LC activity because they've got PTSD or they've got autism or just pissed off to have this stupid rehab, whatever it is. So, VNS may be doing two things. It may be reducing the level of time activity, 
of what this means, while adding as phasic components to label each individual. So essentially what we think we can do now is weaken the connections that are too strong, strengthen the connections that are too weak in an appropriate manner. And the goal is to take these overlap representations that when you've had trauma, and it can be a sexual assault, an IED, you can all these things lie together in the brain because the brain has been damaged, the networks have been damaged. And the recovery from that is challenging because there's all these vicious feedback loops that keep drawing you back into pathology. By adding the vagus nerve stimulation, if you can separate these things out and return people back to their lives, you can turn off the vagus nerve stimulator and not use it again. If you happen to have a relapse later, we turn them back on and do a new treatment if that's necessary. I'll just conclude by saying that I think brief bursts of vagus nerve stimulation compared with specific events seem to drive the neuroplasticity that's highly specific <coughs> and long lasting. At least in principle, so far, the little trials not done. Promise have been shown that using this targeted neuroplasticity <laughs> therapy, whether it's focal or diffuse, whether it's central or peripheral, it might be possible to treat things that cannot be treated currently. And the big surprise, which I think is most optimistic, is not just that DNS is magic and awesome, it might be, but that it's possible to make recovery and rehabilitation alone doesn't apply. And that's what we all hope for, that we can do a lot better. We all come to work every day thinking there's this new thing, it just turned out to be really, really hard. To find a way to triple or quadruple the gain that we can think of. And this may be one useful tool. Hopefully, there are many more. I want to acknowledge all of the um, faculty, students, and staff at the Texas Biomedical Device uh, Center, located on the top floor of BSB, uh, the new building on North Campus. Uh, the concept is having a third of people working on medicine, a third of people working on science, a third of people working on engineering, puts all these pieces together so that as we come up with another problem, we can iterate around this cycle. And ask for the university to acknowledge my financial conflict uh, as a consultant for and shareholder in a small company that spun off into the Collective Transponder, and of course to thank all the funding agencies and mention that none of the uh, treatments that I have done throughout the day are yet FDA approved, and of course most importantly to thank the uh, faculty uh, and staff uh, at the Texas Biomedical Device Center, in particular Ron Lander, the director of the Texas Biomedical Device Center, uh, Seth Hayes, uh, the uh, in charge of preclinical research. Uh, and, and a large list of people who really put their reputations on the line and tried something new and different. Uh, Jane Williams, who gave up her, uh, many of her, much of her time at UT Southwest, who's emergency room, to join us and to make this new, alternate view of how we can recover from these injuries. So, I'd be happy to take any questions.